Got it. All right, now there are five of us. So two attendees and Tim's here and Sam is here. And Allegra's here, I'll let her in. Uh, just allow her to talk, promote to panelist. Okay, okay, Allegra should be in. Eliza Campbell, Ashley's here, okay. Put her in, promote to panelist. Paul is here. Colin, put, promote to pan, Rob is here, promote to panelist. Well, this is happening pretty slow because it's not happening. Okay, wait a minute, promote to panelist. All right, something's happening with Rob and Paul that it's not, they're not moving. Okay, whoop, there. I it's think just Rob just got in. Okay, yeah, and Paul just got in. Paul's coming in. Yep. Sid is here. All right, Sid's hello, here. Hello, hello. Oops. Sid is here, yeah. Sid is here. He's, yep, yeah, Risha is here. Okay. Do we have everyone? Looks like we have everyone. Did we miss anybody? I think we're all here. Yeah, I don't see anyone missing. Or um, 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 we are our new uh, Grover. Here. Grover Grover's isn't here. here. Yeah, Grover's not here yet. But I think that there, did, did Grover say there was some reason why they couldn't be at this? I don't remember that. Really? Oh, so, Grover's here. Grover's here. I'm going to let Grover in. Okay. Super. Grover. Should, yep. Here is Grover. I think we're all here. All right. Fantastic. Welcome, everyone, to the June 8th meeting of Housing Trust coming to order at 7.01. It's really good to see everybody. Um, we are grateful to Rob, who said he would take notes again since uh, George isn't available this time. And um, I think that our first order of business is we have two sets of minutes to hopefully accept. One of them is the minutes from our May meeting, the meeting of May 8th. The minutes should have gone out a while ago with things that Nate sent. Uh, are there any comments or questions or anything about the May minutes? Um, hearing none, I am going to accept them. Um, assume I do. I don't have to vote on this. Do it. We will accept the minutes since there are no questions or comments about the minutes from our meeting of May eighth. Um, so the minutes have been accepted. The other set of minutes we have are the minutes from the joint meeting with CRC that was May, I believe it was the 18th, but I might be getting the date wrong, but the minutes right. have gone out. And Eric is telling me I got the date right. So uh, are there any questions or concerns or anything about the minutes from this joint CRC meeting of May 18th? I didn't know nobody saying anything. Uh, so I am going to assume that the meetings are acceptable as presented. And uh, therefore, unless I hear something in the next couple of moments, the meeting minutes for May 18th have been accepted. So Thanks. with all with all of that little bunch of stuff done, I'm going to turn the meeting over to Erica to introduce him. Who, either is in the room or will be momentarily. He, he is. He, thank you very much. He is uh, in attendance and we'll move him over to panelists in a few minutes. Um, I have the great pleasure um, to have Tim back. Um, Tim had come once before to talk about Craig's doors uh, and also talk about the new model uh, and the new approach. Um, we actually were together uh, and uh, Carol will talk a little bit about that meeting. Um, Mindy Dom had um, facilitated a meeting with many different um, advocates and 
and to those of us who work on affordable housing and Tim was there as well. And we started talking a little bit about, you know, what um, may be the vision for the old VFW site um, that the town has um, taken over and is planning on creating um, lots of different services, uh, both for permanent sheltering and also um, moving towards some transitional housing. So we thought it'd be really a good idea to start thinking about um, how can we support some visioning? Um, I know that Dave um, has talked about creating uh, a group uh, eventually, but we thought it'd be really important for someone who spends so much time with individuals who are unhoused and um, really has a lot of connections with regard to advocating for those who are unhoused, um, that we start you know, just listening to Tim and seeing what might be some of his vision that we could um, also think about. So Tim, you've got the floor. All right, thank you, Erica, and thank you guys so much uh, for the invitation. Um, it was great seeing you at the conference with Wendy Dom and, and the round table, and I think it was an opportunity for um, a lot of the folks who operate in the housing space. Uh, it's an unfortunately a lot, typically silos, and so we don't always have the opportunity to, to come together and, and um, share in conversation and vision, and it was a good opportunity to sort of see where folks are at. Um, I do know that uh, being in, in regular conversation um, with Dave, uh, that um, they, it's a very prescriptive approach that they're taking, um, that the town has to take in order to sort of um, move the project along. My understanding is that there's hope that there would be demolition um, done by the summer and then they have to go through the, the process of finding an architect. And so, um, I just want to, you know, avoid uh, suggesting in any way that I'm speaking on behalf of the town uh, or that I'm in any way um, privy to, to that process. I know that um, Paul and Dave are working really hard uh, and have a huge number of projects on their plate, um, but I know that they're super committed to the project and it's, it's incredibly exciting uh, to think that there will be a space like this in Amherst. So, um, in terms of modeling for uh, the sort of project that um, I think Craig's Doors uh, would love to see, um, I can point to uh, what's called the Yaki Housing Resource Center. Um, it's a, it's, it exists in Quincy, Mass. Um, it was recently opened. They had a ribbon cutting ceremony and um, it really illustrates, I think, uh, what, all of the academic and um, as far as sort of data aggregation and research and empirically supported programming, um, along with the historical housing first model, I think it, it really does do a terrific job of blending um, sort of the things that we know work from the past with the things uh, that we know don't work. Um, and so that program in particular is a multi-use building um, it has emergency shelter capacity. Um, it has um, mental health resources on site. It has medical resources on site. Um, it has transitional housing, and I believe it has a PSH component as well. So uh, not to suggest um, that in our vision, there would be a, a medical office or uh, like a, a specific clinician, although we would love to, depending on how far down the line this is, um, Craig's Doors would love to have a, a, a clinical component and um, we'll be having some exciting partnerships that we'll be announcing um, later this uh, summer. Um, but we're going to be bringing on some folks in the area who have some, some really amazing expertise um, from the more mental health perspective. Um, but I think, you know, the best that I can do is to sort of speak in generalities um, and to emphasize the overwhelming need to, to acknowledge that the population that's entering, and entering into permanent supportive housing spaces, these PSH programs are almost never receiving the services that they require to be successful. So um, I guess what I'm suggesting is even when we are exercising the housing first model, we're getting someone um, into shelter, the services that are supposed to follow um, rarely ever actually come through. 
And so it's imperative that the that the services be brought to the population rather than trying to get the population to the services. Um, and so I think this idea of a hub um, is is really a priority model. Um, and so again, without getting into any level of detail, the idea rather than having a medical a medical office that's specific to one practitioner would be having space where practitioners can come and meet with their uh, their guest or their patient or their client, whatever that terminology is. Um, I think that there is a small need for administrative uh, space, but above all, I think is creating safe spaces where people can meet individually with their privacy respected um, that is in immediate proximity to their home, to, to where they're, where they're uh, gaining shelter. Um, the more that we look at these sort of wraparound uh, opportunities, I think what, what fails most often um, is a lack of authentic collaboration. And so part of our mission right now um, is working as hard as we can to, to get together with all of the other community uh, organizations in the Valley that offer um, the critical services that our guests rely on um, and the population that we serve rely on. Um, and so I think moving into, into the future and imagining um, what this space could be, uh, I think you know, it's not exclusive to one entity by any measure. It's a, it's a space where, um, you know, again, these siloed components of self-efficacy and independence and safety um, are able to share in a physical space and collaborate at a deeper level um, to the support of the tenants. Um, and the more that we can help build that self-efficacy for the tenants, um, that offers, uh, that of course affords um, higher success rates and, and the ability to exit homelessness. But to, like, I, I really want to emphasize this to truly exit homelessness. Um, because what we're finding too frequently are that we're able to get people housed. We go through this this process, it can be a five-year process. It can be a 10-year process. We have people who have stayed with us who, have, who haven't had a lease in 20 years and get keys in their hands. And then they don't know what to do from there. And it's, not, it's like, how could they, right? Like what, what experience would have prepared them for that over the last 20 years? Um, and the expectation is that they're going to be followed with services, but it just doesn't happen. And then a year later, we find them returning to homelessness. So these cycles of homelessness don't just end with getting someone inside. It requires community buy-in and it requires everyone um, that is performing services that support this population to be able to come into a space to collaborate and for that space to be uh, a cultural hub for change in terms of, uh, I think, um, overall uh, care and well-being for, for each other's neighbors on a community level. Um, as well as a, a clinical space and a therapeutic space and a, a place that um, like we've tried to do emulates the benefits of home. So um, Craig's Doors uh, was honored and I'm sorry, I can go on for hours. I'll, I'll try and be quicker. Um, but Craig's Doors was honored uh, with being named the uh, one of the only pilot programs on the East Coast for the Federal Reimagining Homelessness Initiative. Um, it is uh, being led by a coalition of experts, um, primarily those with lived experience. One of our board, our newer board members, Sean Del Diaz, um, who is uh, an administrator for the uh, three county COC, um, served as a consultant and helped us um, to, again, uh, be honored with the opportunity. And a lot of it has to do with language, right? So instead of talking about having uh, a congregate shelter, we might call it interim housing. And I know that um, we go through these periods where we sort of change language and, uh, and that can be for a myriad of reasons, but I think in this space in particular, it's really important um, because it, it, it's baffling how frequently uh, resources and opportunities are, um, are unavailable to, to our guests because they are homeless, because they're identified as homeless. So when they have to write down a shelter um, on a job application or on a housing application, um, 
you know, you can you can tell me statistics and you can show me reports all day about uh, anti-discrimination policies among um, landlords and, and housing communities, but it's just, it, it's a very real thing. Um, and so again, looking towards using terms like interim housing to describe uh, what could be a congregate shelter, having a non-congregate shelter option, um, having uh, transitional housing, maybe having some permanent supportive housing and maybe having some affordable housing units. I think it's about getting really creative with the space. And above all, the most important component is again, that multi-purpose element and ensuring that uh, there are uh, the required services and supports so that everybody at every level of their journey um, utilizing this community resource is, is able to, to be seen, to be able to met where, to be able to be met where they're at um, and to be able to have success in leveraging um, what is really like a not only not only an incredibly needed but an incredibly progressive and innovative community resource. This this is you know we have an opportunity to as a as a town to really form the model that can be replicated and and have legitimate systemic impact on um, ending what results in very real individual trauma. Paul? I just, I just want to like recognize Tim and his team, what they've been doing. I mean, it's, to speak with such specificity and nuance to the needs of the community is just really, it's really, really fortunate for us to have. When we first looked at this, the council said finding a permanent shelter as a goal a couple of years ago. We knew, you know, we looked at Father Bill's place as being like, wow, that's a really interesting thing. They got a bunch of, they got four million bucks from the state or something like that. And to be honest, I was thinking we need a place, right? And I was focused on bricks and mortar, and you know, it's going to be a lot of money. It's it's ambitious. Um, Tim is really framing it as sort of a continuum of care model that we also that without that, it's not going to be successful. And so I think that that's been. Um, that's a really valuable perspective, and they've, you know, Craig Stores has been just really remarkable um, in, the, in their efforts this year. Um, in terms of the space, I see Dave Z and Dave Zomack in the audience. If we could bring him in, I'd appreciate that. You know, we have the first order of business, and our biggest challenge was finding a location that met the zoning and location needs and all that. We were really fortunate to jump on the VFW site. It's going to take a long time to develop this. It's a big number in terms of millions of dollars that we have to secure. Um, but we're going to be working on this. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, you know, as, as a team, as a partnership um, with a lot of our agencies. So, um, but again, first, just kudos to Tim. The sort of acuity of, of identifying what specifically works and being on the forefront like Craig Stores is, is just, we should be really proud of our community and, and the leadership there. And in terms of the space, you know, I'm, I'm really proud that we were able, we had the opportunity to use ARPA funds to secure the space, to secure the site. And now the big task comes in, you know, it's, I don't know, Dave, Dave can comment. We're sort of putting the number out there of eight to $10 million to really bring this to, to light because it is, we have, we have big ambitious goals for this and whether we can achieve that is going to be a question. Dave's in the room. Dave, do you want to respond? Sure. I'm, I'm just joining. I just heard the last of Tim's comments, so I, I may have missed some things here. Apologies for being a few minutes late. But just to build on what Paul said, yeah, I think everyone on the trust and in and the audience knows that we did uh, purchase the VFW uh, site. Um, my staff and I are now working on kind of next steps. Um, one, of, one of the first steps is just really kind of assessing the, the building. Uh, you may have noticed that there's now a dumpster out in, in, inside, uh, outside the building. So we will be getting the building ready for demolition. That means basically stripping down the building of anything that isn't attached. and then. Um, we have um, basically put out um, a call for um, estimates for demolition of the building. The goal there is to kind of clean up the site, get everything ready, 
uh, eventually the town would do something similar to what we did down at East Street School and um, Belchertown Road. Um, you know, again, work with the trust, work with the community, work, uh, you know, in collaboration with Craig's Doors and others to put out an RFP for the site. Um, we're also hoping uh, it would likely be this fall. Right now, we we are going on all cylinders uh, and down a few staff, but it would likely be in the fall that we would um, bring on an architect to at least do some uh, preliminary renderings of what a, a building could look like there. Again, with the broad vision of having a shelter and other supportive space on the first floor and then um, um, supportive housing of some type uh, on the second and third uh, floor. So very early, but we're getting the site ready, doing some cleanup. It'll take us some months to remove the building and uh, do some other uh, work. But as Paul said, you know, probably in the seven to $10 million range is a rough number for what uh, this building may cost. And those numbers will fluctuate based on on um, uh, the market out there, the, the building market. Uh, um, so yeah, that's happy to take questions. So Ashley had her hand up, but before Ashley, um, uh, I recognize Ashley. I just wanna say um, what is gonna be really, really important is all of us um, taking what Tim just talked about and thinking about how to design the RFR. The RFR uh, is gonna be so important to um, for us to then have that end goal of this, you know, continuum of care, this uh, hub, this this really opportunity for what I hear Tim talking about, which is an opportunity to really transform um, how we work with individuals who know their experience, who know what they need, and um, we're just here to provide the support to make it successful for them. So that RFR is gonna be really, really important for all of us to come together and vision and make sure that that's, that space reflects that vision. So let me recognize Ashley first, and then uh, I think Carol was next. Uh, so let's go Ashley first. Okay, well, I, I really like this model and I think it is, likely to be very cost effective compared to any other thing we're calling affordable housing in Amherst. And I'm wondering, you know, this will be, I guess, the test case, but I wonder if we could be scaled up so that this one was with, you know, people transitioning out of homelessness, but there could be these kinds of buildings with on the first floor, different kinds of nonprofits, different kinds of resources, and maybe commercial space, and then floors of very low cost dorm like buildings and those people that live in those dorms could be have you know mental health issues or not they could be workers they could be people just coming out of college and they just need a dorm room that's very low cost and they could be working on the first floor i wonder if this is a good model for very low cost very efficient affordable housing compared to the $500,000 a unit affordable housing we're doing now and serve a lot more people who don't need a house or a duplex. They need an apartment that's like a dorm room. Thank you, Ashley. Carol? Um, I don't know. Uh, okay, well, I had two thoughts or one thought and a question. And the thought is, given the combination of what Paul Dave and Tim just said, I wonder if it wouldn't be useful for the town to have some kind of steering committee for this project that includes people like Tim. Tim, unless he's too busy to do it. But anyway, why not at the beginning, right now when you're getting started, develop a team that includes the other kinds of expertise that we need from other people other than the town staff and the trust, I, we would be happy to participate, but I even think it's more important actually in this case for people like, like Tim who've been doing this work on the ground for a while. So I'm asking why not? And also suggesting that that happens. And I guess my other question is much simpler. If, if Tim or somebody could just give us a link to the place in Quincy, the Yaki or whatever it was, yeah, absolutely. I'd like to be able to look that up. Thank you. No sweat. Uh, I think Allegra, you're next and then Grover. 
Thank you, Tim, for bringing forward the idea of having the services on site. I think that's so important. Um, and I actually, I just watched a webinar this week about youth homelessness. And although it was a pilot for trying to prevent um, the initiation of opioid use with youth and you know exiting homelessness, it was supportive housing. And the, you know, the retention rates in housing after like nine months were in the 80% at least, if not yeah. higher. So I think Maybe. there's real promise to a model like that. Um, so I'm glad that that's something that we're looking into. My question is, would there, and this might be like too early to know, but would there be any funding through like DHCD for either building or would that just be for once it's up and running operational costs? I don't know who that would go to, maybe Paul or Dave. I know CDAC put a, uh, put a put form, they helped, you know, the state will put money into these pro programs. I think it's a high priority for the state. So we'd look at any avenue and work with DHCD to get funding for it. So CDAC mm -hmm. is the community, uh, let's just say, development assistance, something, Nate will help. But. And then this is kind of off topic, but also related. Is University Motor Lodge is that or that is that still running as a shelter site? Yeah, thank you so much. I I wasn't I, I've got a I typically anticipate the roundhouse update um, and didn't anticipate to jump so much into the project. Um, but we are actually the UML site. We are moving um, that program to the bottom floor of the Econo Lodge in Hadley. Um, for a variety of reasons um mm -hmm. above all at the center um the fact that it's just a it, the building is going to afford such a dramatic increase in the quality of life of the guests that ultimately that's what all of our decisions boil down to and, and this one is no different in, in um yeah it makes sense in terms of again accessibility and being able to get to downtown northampton to get to these appointments luckily we have our free transit program um, thanks to partnership with Town Hall and Crest, um, so that our guests are able to access. But even still, there are disability limitations. There are uh, uh, circumstantial limitations that even provided all the resources in the world. If it's not down the hall, um, you know, you're not going to make your appointment. Thank you, Grover. Mine is very technical question, which is, Erica, you used an acronym I'm not familiar with, and I'm wondering if you could define it because you said it was so important and it was RFAR. Uh, request for uh, re response. Okay, thank you. Sure, uh, and Dave and Paul, you can correct me. I think it's RFR request for response. That's what we use for the state, so I'm not sure if the municipalities use the same thing, but it's generally request for response. So the process is that we put out an RFR and then, yeah, someone, lots of response. And um, we actually, uh, Carol and I and, and the whole trust spent a lot of time putting the RFR out for East Street and Belchertown Road. Um, that was the first one I was involved in. And we spent a lot, a lot of time really thinking about the vision we had. And so it's a real great opportunity to, you know, just not look at the site in terms of buildings, but in terms of a hub and how people are interact and how you want to create community and really, um, you know, take what Tim said and really create a vision out of that. Uh, and that I think that's so important in terms of design um, because that's what we want people to respond to. Right. Any other questions or comments? I would just love to emphasize I am not a developer of any kind. I have absolutely no knowledge in how those projects work. Um, but you know, Craig's Doors is such a we're we're just such a a proud member of the Amherst community in any way that we can help um, Paul and Dave and, and the folks at Town Hall and uh, or the trust. You know, we're we're here to help in any way that we can, and uh, we're grateful to be a part of any conversation. Thank, Thank you. you, Tim. Um, Rob, Rob. 
Um, could you clarify what the RFR would be for? Is it is it for a builder? Is it for service providers? Who who is it being? Who are we asking for responses from? That's a really good question, Dave. Do you want to respond to that? So yeah, I'll take a stab. Um, I think you know in the discussions we've had, Paul, Nate, myself, Rob, Mora. Um, I think the goal here, not to get ahead of ourselves, is really to think about the site. I think Erica said it best and following Tim's comments about, you know, really what what infrastructure improvements, what kind of building do we want? What are our goals for serving uh, the community and serving those folks in our community who need uh, who ne who need the kind of services that, that uh, Craig's doors provide and need the the the, um, the housing that we hope to create here. So it's kind of in my mind like uh, almost creating a program. When the schools, uh, Fort River School, great example, you bring experts together, you create a program. In other words, how do we meet the needs of those people in our community? So that uh, that function uh, is carried out by a building. Uh, you know, we'll we'll. So I think we start with the building, uh, but serving those needs of the people in the community. The town of Amherst, to be clear, we, I, I think, Paul, I'll, I'll be, I, I think I'm clear on this, which is we, we, we would not be in the sheltering business. That's not the goal of the town of Amherst. So somewhere along the line, we, we would work on the, the physical infrastructure, the building, the site, parking, access, all of that, um, with the developer. So we would put out an RFP or an RFR like we did with the trust for uh, Belchertown Road and, and East Street School. It, it would likely then be the successful um, uh, um, bidder, if you will, who might then put out some sort of a, or create some sort of a process to select a provider, a service provider. They would bring the services to the site. Um, I don't think it would be the town of Amherst because we are not in in the business. We we, we have no business. Uh, that's not what we do best. So we would let the experts uh, create that. And we've got great potential partners in Valley CDC and Home City and Wayfinders and and CSO and many others in Craig's Doors. So so I think we're going to work on the building and what the building might be like and and uh, with a developer. And then we would we would. Uh, we would hand that off to, to the experts to, to bring in the services to support those people. Grover, do you still have your hand up? So um, RFP, RFR, same thing, request for um, responses or request for proposals. Um, and so um, I think, you know, what Carol mentioned before, having a steering committee way before, I think is really important because um, again, what you just mentioned, Dave, in terms of all the different players, um, we want to make sure that whatever is being designed from the developer real, will really meet the needs of that vision that Tim talked about. So having all those different players who would understand, you know, confidential space or a space that creates community, um, you know, space that gives, you know, a trajectory of slow independence. Um, that's really important right from the beginning. So Tim, I think you had your hand up and then Ashley. Um, I was just gonna, I'm, I'm looking for, uh, I actually had some good content about the Father Bill site, um, the Yaki Resource Center. I'm looking for it. If I can't find it, Erica, I'll, I'll get it over to you. I just wanted to give that heads up. Yep, thank you. And then I'll, I'll we'll send it to everybody. I also feel obligated to emphasize, obviously, the scale of Father Bill's versus, you know, Quincy and Amherst are not the same space. And while we do carry a regional need for sure, uh, in terms of um, Craig's door sites, you know, the, the the emphasis on Father Bill's more than anything is that it has conduits to allow the services uh, that are required by the tenants to be local, on-site, available, and accessible. Um, but I just wanted to emphasize when you do look at it, the scale is not anything that I uh, am, am alluding to. Thank you, Tim. Ashley? Yeah, I was going to ask Tim, like, if you had all the money that you need, how many people would you serve? And, you know, don't limit it to people that already live in Amherst. Like, if you were going to 
serve anybody that needs it how many how many people are you thinking i think you know it's a tough question as it is a it's a really important question and, and, it, and it's one that we ask ourselves regularly um um from an organizational perspective you know i think what what we found to be the most important thing and this is a really difficult and complicated response i'm going to do but i'm going to do my best to be sincere and, and, and authentic um and transparent so i think what we found at craig stores since um, our administration took over was that the heads on beds model which is let's get as many people in as we possibly can was a radical failure for the people that we were able to bring in what it did was it alleviated the pressure from other communities to participate um, while limiting our ability to provide the necessary services that I've been talking about, right? Um, and so, you know, when we got to uh, the level of about 63 in aggregate as an organization, um, that felt like it was shouldering quite a bit of the regional burden, but it also was clearly providing a, an incredibly necessary service and access to a community um, that does draw a lot of folks um, towards it because it is uh, a progressive and welcoming and engaging and, and inclusive uh, community. And I, I would never want to speak to limiting the the uh, potential scale and impact of that community and, and, and what it can do. Um, but at the same time, I think we have to be conscious of ensuring that we're not tipping the scale so far that we have so many people that we can't take care of and that we can't ensure the success of. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I couldn't give you a number right now. I can tell you that 63, um, where we're operating now, feels like, um, if anything, tipping further away from uh, what I would consider to be a, a more balanced point, which would probably be in the 50 to 60 range. With that said, if I had all the money in the world, you know, I'd take everyone in the region. You know, I, I, I can't tell you how transformed I've been through this work and seeing what it is, what suffering really is for an individual who is in a state of survival, who doesn't want to be in a state of survival. Um, so, you know, we'd house everyone that we possibly could, but in order for the entire region to start waking up and, and taking accountability um, for this problem, um, you know, and, and ensuring that we can provide successful supports and services it really is more of a, it's a finer balance than, than you might anticipate. Um, that's not to say that I, I don't appreciate how welcoming Amherst is, um, only that we need other municipalities, particularly Holyoke, where um, uh, there are no shelters currently. Um, you know, we wanna make sure that there is accessibility uh, throughout the region and, and that not just bottlenecked. Well, okay, so this is the highest needs people. So the, these people will need the most services, the most 24 seven, someone's there, there's therapists, there's lots of people. So, I mean, I'm just saying that this model potentially, Tim, could work with people who need less services. I mean, oh, totally. this is the most expensive one. The next one might be a little less expensive and so on and so forth because we're, you're not, this will have the most amount of people that will need to work there all the time. The next mm -hmm. one could have people just nine to five. Absolutely. No, I, I, I am a major fan of looking into innovative approaches to affordable housing. Don't, you know, you'll never find me on the other side of that. Um, I only mean to say that when it comes to, to sheltering the way that we shelter and, and I take a lot of pride in the way that we shelter, which is we still remain a low threshold shelter. So, you're right, we are taking people who have uh, comorbidities and complex physical and mental health issues. We have people who have sub active substance use disorder. And what's been amazing is that by creating these, these smaller versions of these hubs, like we have at the ILC right now or at our resource center, you know, you're, you're able to provide such a direct level of continued care and consistency that um, a lot of the mental health struggles that folks face, they don't need to be clinical to be therapeutic, right? We can, we can have folks who can, uh, again, rely on staff that they know and, and know will be there to create that sense of, um, uh, of continued support, 24-7 uh, service support, um, 
you know, without having to uh, overdevelop infrastructure, if that makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands up. And thank you for everyone for, you know, putting your hands up so we can make sure everybody gets a chance to speak. Um, so I'm going to thank Tim. Um, it's the work that you're doing is amazing. Uh, I absolutely agree with what Paul said. Your vision is comprehensive and it's focusing on transformation. It's focusing on systemic transformation, um, really helping individuals move through their own journey to independence and self-efficacy. I mean, that as a goal is amazing and that should be the goal for every single individual in community. Um, so the work that you're doing is just absolutely amazing. And the fact that you're also very, um, very introspective about wanting to make sure that you are um, working at a place where you can actually help individuals versus numbers and, and counting you know, heads. That I think is just inspiring. So we're gonna continue having you come or have us come to you or, or us working together because um, I think we actually have a vision to work towards with uh, that old site. And I would be so proud um, to see um, that fruition. Um, so I really wanna thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Again, I'm at everyone's disposal all the time. Um, I would love to give tours of this of the shelter anytime anybody wants to come and join an activity. Um, we're really trying to uh, kind of respark that social engagement, and um, we wouldn't want to be doing it anywhere else. So thank you to to everybody here, and don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you, Tim. Bye, guys. Bye. All right, we're going to move to the next item on our agenda, and that's um, the listening session. Um, so I'm going to ask Ashley and Allegra to join me in just giving an update if I've missed anything. Um, we've been working for months now, uh, and the WE is uh, it's the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, uh, the Human Rights Commission, the Board of Health, and the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. Um, so we've all been working very closely, um, meeting almost every week uh, in terms of planning for the June 20th listening session. Um, and including that too, uh, thank you, Nate and Jennifer uh, Moyston, who's been part of this as well from the town. Um, so it's going to be June 20th uh, from 6.30 to 8.30 at the Bank Center. So we hope this is an in-person meeting. It's not hybrid, it's gonna be in person. And as we talked about before, we're thinking about uh, having 10 uh, tables where people can um, uh, talk to each other and we're gonna facilitate conversations about what priorities are, what people think priorities should be uh, with regard to housing the town of Amherst, what their experiences are, lived experience, um, professional experience. So we're very, very excited um, that it's really two weeks away um, so um, let me just ask Allegra and Ashley if there's anything that they want to um, add to the... Go ahead, Ashley. You're on mute, Ashley. I guess I, I think it's really going well. And I, I guess just a little tiny bit of conflict I have is that putting the burden on people that need affordable housing and already live in for affordable housing seems a little bit wonky when you know clearly we need a lot more affordable housing and it needs to be a lot cheaper and that th there will be a report apparently like we're going to create a report um all together you know the different committees and i just wonder what what the town's responsibility will be to read this report and then do things that make affordable housing more or better according to the wishes of the people in it or the people that want it like how is the report going to be taken is i think as important as even just having a, a forum for people to talk about affordable housing is great it what matters is if it gets better because of it you know so how could we make that happen that if they say we need lots more affordable housing it needs to be a lot cheaper perhaps, how will that be incorporated into Amherst affordable housing? I don't know, but I mean, I don't know what they will say, but let's say they say a lot of things, you know? Uh, 
Would anybody like to respond to that? Including us. I mean, we're the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust. And so we're asking for people to voice, you know, their experiences and the concerns. Risha, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, obviously I can't speak on behalf of the town, but I, I had understood that this was going to be a major input into our next five-year strategic plan. Um, and so that is what I'm hoping. I, I also, you know, not to be too researchy about this, but um, I'm not sure who we're going to hear from. And it's great to hear from everybody, but it, um, I don't think we should assume that we will only be hearing from people who have who are currently in affordable housing or looking for affordable housing. I suspect there will be a lot of people who are in not affordable housing who have lots of opinions <laughs> on it. Um, and and so ciphering through that. But yeah, I, I'm I'm hoping to to take it as one of the primary inputs into our next priorities. Thank you, Risha. And I just also want to add, um, thank you, Nate, for putting it on the uh, town website. Um, so people can use the QR code to answer the questions if one, they want to submit their comments in writing uh, or cannot make the session or if they want to come to the session as well. Um, so uh, we've been distributing the flyers. Uh, Lagers had them translated into four different languages. Uh, along with English. And it's so we're really, I know when I've been walking around talking to people, asking them to go ahead and submit their responses, even if they're you know, gonna come because anything can happen on the 20th, they might decide you know, they, they can't make it. But to get that response would be really important. Um, so we have two opportunities, one written responses through the QR code on our webs on the um, town website and the other is coming in person and participating. Um, so we're very excited. We're hoping that it's going to be a really rich discussion. Um, and then if anybody wants to work with us to then take all of that information um, and then uh, create a report out of that, we absolutely welcome. Um, we're hoping that as many of you can come on the 20th. Um, we may need some help with some of the tables, uh, just in terms of facilitation. Uh, we already have the three questions that we're gonna ask. Um, Philip Avila and Liz Haygood are going to be the main facilitators of the night. Um, and uh, the rest of us who are part of the planning committee are gonna help facilitate at each table. Um, so we're really excited about doing this. Um, I think it's a real opportunity and we talk about, we wanna listen to what people have to say. Um, so it's an opportunity to really be present and, and just really listen. Okay, I think I'm not seeing any hands up. So, up oh, Grover. I was just gonna say, I'll be there and I can help at a table. Thank you, Grover. All right, uh, so not seeing any other hands up. We will go ahead and move to Carol. So I don't know how much there is to add here. There are two things that happened that it seemed that we should update people on. One was we did have, but you were there, the joint trust with CRC and the trust. And so I guess I would just maybe wanna point out about that. And the minutes went out, everyone saw them, they've been accepted. Um, there are some things in there. It was mostly um, Mandy Joe that suggested what people might do next and had the staff focusing on zoning and discussions with the planning board and the CRC trying to get some of those priorities into manager goals so that they can be so that they can be um, move forward more easily. Uh, they might do some survey and outreach on what people want, although we're also doing that obviously with the as was just discussed. Um, and we might be able to, although this might be a thing the town wants to do, we can uh, um, Paul can tell us about that. Begin to have some conversations with UMass about housing. I mean, we're not concerned just about students, but also about workforce housing. Um, how can we have employees at UMass and at town and various town places, even, even police and firefighter sorts of people, how can we begin to think about um, workforce housing? That's something that maybe the trust can think about 
Um, and then there are perhaps town properties that we, I at least certainly don't probably even know about. So there might be some effort that we could put into, put in with the town to look at whatever property the town does own and to begin to thinking about in some of the creative ways that people have been talking about, is there some something here that could be done to have this be able to be um, useful as housing in some kind of way, either something else like what the VFW hopefully is going to become or something more like Ball Lane or like East Gables or like something entirely else, who knows? But um, we could at least have some kind of inventory maybe of what the properties are that might conceivably be considered and maybe none of them will work, but maybe some of them might, especially if we keep thinking about uh, newer, different, um, out of the, out of, the box uh, ways of thinking about things we might do something. So I think that everyone was was there or a lot of, I can't remember honestly at this minute who was there and who wasn't. But uh, if there are comments or questions about what we did with the CRC, we didn't specifically say we should meet together again, but we certainly didn't specifically say we won't. It seemed kind of more like a beginning than like a done deal. Um, so there certainly, I believe, would be room to continue the, some of the conversations we had if, if that's what we we uh, think we want to do. So I will ask if to see if there's any questions or further comments or anything anybody wants to say. And I see that Ashley already has a hand up. So Ashley. So we're getting a new school that is making apparently two other schools empty. And I'm just wondering, like going forward, when we get a new building or and other buildings are vacated and also whatever empty building Amherst has or UMass has or Amherst College has, is that on the radar of the town to like put that into the you know, we had to vote on this new um, school and it won, but that makes two empty buildings. Like, why isn't it just central to like, whatever is going on and makes an empty building in Amherst is that could be affordable housing. And is that central to what you're thinking about when you're making a new building and vacating other buildings? Always. Uh... Paul, thanks. Yeah, so so it actually will be one building because one bu one building is on the site. So the Fort River School building will be demolished, but that'll be replaced by the new school. The wild, uh, Wildwood building will be vacant and the town council obviously has been thinking about what that site could be used for. There's been lots of suggestions for use of that site. That ultimately, the council will have to decide the process. It's, you're, you're a few years away from having that building become uh, available. Uh, the school committee would have to say they don't need it for educational purposes anymore. If they say that, then it reverts to the town's possession. And at that point, uh, the town would go through a process about how, it, if that building is useful, can it be um, changed into a, a, another existing use, or is that site useful for some other thing? So, so uh, and the question is, is it is it central to everything you do with a new building that or just empty buildings are, I mean, is it working to see if those could be affordable housing central to the idea of whatever you're building next? Like, is it why did I don't think we should have to bring up every single time? Oh, there's an empty building. Why don't we use it for affordable housing? Are you are you proposing to use affordable like? whatever empty building becomes accessible, can are you putting in affordable housing? That's like a possibility without us meeting every month, you know? So, I mean, whenever there's a vacant building there, you know, there are a range of needs and uses that the town can use it for. It's a, you know, public policy discussion by the council particularly. Um, you know, there, you know, people have talked about a senior center, senior housing, um, a, a cultural center, um, you know, a, 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 
all different options for different buildings. All those things have to be considered by the town. Affordable housing is central. Obviously, we, we are always on the lookout for sites for affordable housing, which we've been very successful at. That's why we transformed the East Street School and we purchased the Belchertown Road parcels um, for this for that purpose. But yeah, so I, um, I guess, I'm not really sure what the question is. Yes, the town is always focused on affordable housing and developing more affordable housing. Um, so. Uh. Over. Ashley, what I hear you asking is, I, I'm understanding it as a next level request, or I think you're pointing out that it seems like the town goes currently with an array of options model where every individual vacant property is considered with the range of possibilities. And it is an option that we have, I believe that we could advocate for a formal vacant land affordable housing policy where affordable housing got the top priority, but we would have, as a community, we would have to advocate for the council to pass that. Um, and as my understanding is that it's currently not the policy. Yeah, I mean, that would be great to have affordable housing be the priority. I mean, there's a bunch of land at Hickory Ridge that is not affordable housing yet. There's going to be an empty school. There's, you know, there might be a myriad of ex these things that I'm always continuously saying affordable housing should be the priority because actually it's more important than a lot of senior centers, which we already have one. Could, maybe we could have a, a, a joint meeting with the CRC to see if they would help us prioritize affordable housing over many other things that is, you know, lots of people want senior centers for sure, but a lot of people need affordable housing. How do we make that more important in the myriad of choices? And I think we need the CRC to help us because they are town council members, clearly. Okay, so I, th I think that that's an interesting thing that we could just try to think about in the way that Grower and you have both suggested. Is it something we want to try to talk with the town council about urging them to, to make this a top priority? And that's that would be a way to go to try to get something like this to happen. I don't have any idea how much support it would have or wouldn't have but it does seem like something that we could attempt to do. And there's two more people who wanna talk, which are Erica and then Dave. Thank you. Um, so I thought I heard um, when I spoke to John, uh, who's in the audience about that there might be a policy that would include a right of refusal, meaning that when Paul talked about first the school committee, because they have the right, that's their building, that's what it was used for, to refuse, then it goes back to the town if we were to be able to create a policy that says, then we would be next and taking, being able to look at the building. And if we then decided that it was not optimal or we, it was just too you know, out of reach, then, then it would revert back to the town in terms of those other spectrum of, of you know, options. Um, that would require you know, writing a policy. Um, so Ashley, I don't know if you'd be willing to think about uh, drafting a policy that would start now. Honey, sorry, that, I'm sorry. That we could take to the CRC um, and to then think about, um, you know, presenting a policy. And if they were to be on board with that, we can then present it to the town council. Um, but I will now let Dave speak. You're mute, Dave. Uh, there we go. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm not going to speak to the policy. I'm not going to um, address that. But I just wanted to to kind of reemphasize or emphasize even more uh, what Paul said earlier, because, um, you know, um, I'm sitting here with with my colleague, Nate Malloy and and Rob Moore and Chris Brestrup. And I, I just want to assure the group that um, we spend a tremendous amount of time uh, and are committed to looking at every available option. And I was, as, as you all were talking, I was thinking about the number of affordable housing projects that we've, we as a community have gotten done in the last 10 years. And um, housing, I, I just wanna reassure everybody, it is 
at the top of our list. I, I, there is no policy, but we, we as planners, I mean, part of my job and part of Nate's job and Rob Mora's job and Chris Prestrup's job and other planners' jobs is to think about the community's needs. And there's no question that affordable housing is right up there. Clearly, as Paul illustrated, a, a large property and a complex property like uh, Wildwood School um, is, is really a, a large community conversation. But um, as we look at things like, oh, working with Beacon Communities in North Amherst, I mean, that was the town that brought in Beacon Communities that ultimately resulted in a collaboration between Beacon and Coles for 130 units of, of housing and 26 affordable units and a, and a very large tax increment financing plan. Um, Olympia, uh, Olympia Oaks, sorry, there's too many Olympia projects up there now, but Olympia Oaks, uh, we we took a uh, piece of property that we, the town, the community, took a piece of property up there that was um, set aside uh, for municipal uses and through a, a, a process decided that seven or eight acres would be used for affordable housing and the back kind of wet portion of the property would be would be conserved and and uh, earlier planning uh, folks worked on that. So I just wanted to reassure you that it is always at the forefront of our minds. We're always trying to think creatively. Uh, East Street School is a great example, picking up that property on uh, uh, um, um, Belchstown Road, same idea. So it's always there. It is, it is we are always working that angle um, and, and trying to figure out. I have a number of properties that I have been looking at and will continue to look at where we've been cultivating relationships with landowners who may be willing to part with their land, maybe not today, maybe not next year, but maybe three years from now. And those properties might be for um, some kind of affordable housing yet to be defined, um, workforce, et cetera, et cetera, whatever the need uh, is in the community. But then there may be other properties that uh, say might have 10 acres of wetland in the back and five acres of developable developable land up front. And, um, you know, um, Hickory Ridge is a great example of that. We are now taking a closer look at the frontage on Hickory Ridge, where the clubhouse is, where the parking lot is, and saying, you know, what, what kind of um, massing could occur there. Uh, we've talked about the potential for a South Amherst fire station there that doesn't preclude other uses of the frontage there. So uh, that's the long-winded way of saying it is always something we're working on five days a week when we're when we're we're in the office. And so I'm looking you, yeah. well, that's probably some of the time that you're not. Ashley, go yeah, ahead. The, reason, the reason we need a policy is so that when these things come up we're not talking about senior centers and we're not talking about fire stations. We're talking about affordable housing second. So whoever has the building and now vacate, vacates it, it goes to us first. And so we don't, we just skip that process where you think of a lot of different things. We don't think yeah. of, we think of affordable housing first because it has come to us when someone hasn't used it. And we don't have to like, like muddy the waters with a whole bunch of stuff when we need affordable housing to come first. The thing is want... actually that that has to be a decision the town makes that it decides that that's what it wants to do. Right, and that's right. the reason the way to, if that is what, I don't know that that's what the town wants. If it does, we can advocate, ask, try to find out something from some of the people in the town council and others about uh, were we to bring something like this, would it fly? What do you think? Is this is this popular? But it, us saying it isn't. We we have a lot of ways to go to find out, and that's right. something that we can do and check out. But there's no magic. There's no magic right. to make that make it be first. I think we need so, a I think we need a meeting with the CRC to propose this. I I mean I could write something up, but the idea is that we could propose it and see what town councilors are in favor of it and then start there, you know, see if we could be putting affordable housing at least second, if not first, and not muddying it around with like what uh, five other things they're trying to deal with. We could okay. ask to Heard. do that. Yes, we can. Um, if there's no, does anybody have anything else they wanna say about this? So that's possibly, of beginning of maybe another CRC meeting or 
whatever other thing makes sense, which might be that. Uh, Grover. Yeah, I mean, I would just like to say, I I do support this idea, Ashley. I, I, would, I would like to see it come to be. And I would also like us to have time to move forward as a body or an entity. And like, like, I would like to add it to the list and then have a time that I hope soon that is the meeting or meetings where we're really hashing out the list and saying, because we're only going to have so much capital to push um, the town council to pass X, Y, Z that we're advocating for. And so really trying to determine what we think will be the most impactful top policies and push for that. So just before we turn our wheels, that would be my opinion is like, put it on the list you know, I don't know where the list lives right now, um, but, and then it to be one of the things we consider. And as these questions come up, it, it allows us to clarify what we're actually, right? Like, like there's an impulse to say, I want us to consider this first. And then it's like, well, actually that's a policy we could advocate for. So that goes in the policy column, as opposed to like, that's a state policy. That's a town policy. Yeah. Can I, can I just ask Grover for a point of the, the list you're suggesting is a list of possible priorities or possible things we would like to see the town legislate about or make a policy about. Is that the, the, yes. what the list is of? Yeah. <laughs> bad, bad grammar. Okay, thanks. Got it. Nate. Yeah, I mean, I think that goes back to having a second meeting with the CRC and maybe it's after another meeting with the trust and, you know, having these discussions. So some of it could be, you know, you mentioned, Carol, you know, talking with UMass. I think addressing student housing is important. You know, um, having certain policies or other incentives is important. So, you know, all of a sudden we have, you know, we could generate a half dozen ideas and we bring it back to the CRC and we discuss, okay, is, is this a policy action? Is it a regulatory action, is it education? And, you know, start figuring out what, who, then who's doing it. And so, you know, we, you know, the, the minutes kind of have some of those ideas. And I think we, you know, another meeting would be important to, you know, maybe the trust has another meeting where we discuss this and then we can meet with the CRC and have, you know, these ideas to discuss because I think it's, you know, there's many, I think a, a number of action steps that could happen. Um, you know, I agree with Grover that, you know, a policy, recommendation or two is one, but I think, you know, conversations with UMass or other ideas about student housing is another one, or, you know, even this model with the VFW, you know, that's something that's going to take um, a lot of input. So there's another you know, thing to discuss. Okay. How are we determining what kind of model or process we want to use for the VFW site? And um, so, you know, I feel like just tonight we have half a dozen ideas that we'd want to discuss with the CRC. Um, you know, even zoning, right? Even housing. What what kind of zoning amendments would we want to see? I mentioned at the joint meeting, changing inclusionary zoning. So we have a percentage that's required to be affordable. Is it worthwhile now to say it's you know it hasn't deterred development? Do we tweak that zoning a little bit? And are there other other things we can do? And so you know, in the aggregate, all these things are going to be very you know will work together. I think you know housing can be slow. The town isn't a developer, and so. Even if we have town property, you know, like say Belchertown Road and East Street School, you know, that's years to get something developed. There's other ways that could be more effective to get housing or services or whatever happening. And I think you know, that's that I, that's why I like to, you know, I, I do think we could have another meeting or two at the CRC over the next few months and really, you know, and then with the public forum in June and then other things, we really then have a really good foundation for our strategic plan, the trust strategic plan. And then we have a good understanding of who's doing what uh, in town. Okay, thanks. I think we have a lot of food for thought here and probably something for our own future agenda and building to a future agenda, joint agenda again with, with CRC. Um, I'm going more time than, because this wasn't just a report, it was kind of a what do we do next in more depth than we might have thought of, but I think it was a good discussion. So I guess I don't, the other thing I was going to report on with the May 18th, 18th and 19th, whatever day it was, round table, thanks to our own representative, Mindy Dom. She was able to bring uh, Jim Marciro, the joint chair of the housing committee, to a round table that was attended by the town council, town people who are in other departments of the town. Uh, Gray Stores was there, 
many of the providers, developers, um, the trust was there, represented by Erica and I, and and either also by John Hornick or else he was representing the affordable housing advocacy group. But anyway, he was there. And it seems to me that the most important thing to say about it is that there, everybody had a few minutes to make a, to say what are the things that they thought were most important. And there were repeated themes, like we need more units, we need more of the continuum of care kind of stuff that Tim was talking about. We need to be talking with each other and working together. And we need the state to come forward fund DHCD with more money, uh, match the town's Community Preservation Act amount fully instead of only partly. There were clear asks of, of, of the state, I think, to try to have them working on things. And um, one of the most interesting things I, I remember hearing was some amount of opening on the part of at least the Amherst College president to perhaps finding um, ways that some of the Amherst College, University College land might be able to be helpful to the town in developing affordable housing. So there were openings of all sorts and um, it, was, it was kind of inspiring to have so many different people in the room and to have the opportunity for those two people to listen to what we all had to say about our town. Mindy kind of framed it as so there are things about Amherst that are unique and there are things about Amherst that are just like everywhere else. And that seems like some of those things came out in that in that round table, some of the some of the issues with the university um, and just the size of the town compared to the size of the university is the kind of kind of dramatic in this case. Lots of towns, lots of cities have universities in their midst, but they aren't always such small, so small, the town compared to the university, and we have more than one university. So um, there are other people in this room who were there. If there's anybody who wants to add something, I would welcome that. So Erica, Paul, I think we're both there. Dave, I think you were there, I believe so. If there's anybody who wants to add anything, uh, please speak. Paul. I, I mean, I agree. It, I thought it was a really, it was a unique opportunity for a lot of people to be in the same room, to share their ideas, because we haven't really done that very much since COVID. And it was sort of like people connecting, people hadn't met each other in person, um, who've been in new jobs or been executive directors and things. So it was a, that was an exciting time as well. Um, I think you're right that there were a lot of overlapping themes that people had to share, um, but it was a real um, honor to have the uh, chair and a, a great, you know, kudos to Rep Dom for getting him out here um, and you know, to get someone out to Western Masses and from Boston is often a challenge. So <laughs> that was a good thing for us. And I think that time was well spent. Thank you, uh, Erica. Um, one of the things that I thought was really important, along with what Paul just said, um, and a real opportunity for all of us to sort of see each other in terms of advocacy, action, policy, uh, from lots of different experiences, all the way from advocating for and working with people who are unhoused, all the way to getting permanent, uh, sustainable, um, equitable housing that is also affordable. Um, so all the different um, perspectives that people uh, presented really build on each other. And what, you know, what I walked away with is, is that there's not one answer um, in order to really make a difference uh, in increasing affordable housing, sustainable housing, housing that's, um, you know, available to a range of uh, ages and, and uh, workers. Uh, you really need to work together. And uh, this was a real great opportunity to get everybody into the room and to think about how can we work together. Um, so I, I think uh, Representative Dom did a great job in doing this. One of the things that you know I had spoken to her about is the possibility of getting um, the Secretary of Housing here as well. Um, so Governor Haley and Lieutenant Governor 
Driscoll named um, Edward Augustus as the housing secretary. And so that's another opportunity because I think it has to be a multi-pronged approach. Um, and it has to be, you know, the state, the legislators, uh, you know, the uh, Healy administration, and then us on the municipal level. We need to really have a multi-pronged approach to have enough funding and enough support um, to really make a dent in, in making a difference. So it was exciting, but it's just the beginning. Um, so um, looking forward to the next opportunity to collaborate and, and coordinate. Yeah, that, I guess the one thing I forgot to say or that I meant to say was, it was also the some part of the beginning or somewhere along setting some kind of context was, this is not this is a problem in Amherst, but it's also a problem in Massachusetts. It's also a problem in the entire country. The housing crisis is a crisis everywhere. And it's just worth noting that and not thinking that we're sort of alone. We have some unique things about it that are unique and some things about it that are not really that different than every place that is dealing with similar kinds of problems. Uh, anything else? If not, I'm going to pass it back to Erica, who has her hand up. So what else <laughs> you wanted to say something, or shall I pass it to you? No, uh, I wanted ahead. to say that it, there was an opportunity uh, to hear the president of Amherst College say that they actually have some land that's available. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they're... I really feel the need, and um, hopefully maybe uh, Paul and, and Dave and, and Nate can speak to this position because um, you know, there's only so much you know, uh, I think Carol and I can do to follow up on things, but um, hearing Amherst College say that they're interested and they have availability of land, it's like, I know I was not the only person who walked up to them and said, we're interested. Um, <laughs> But uh, it's it's when those opportunities arise, we need to move fast and we need to follow up. Um, so hopefully we can do that with uh, with Amherst College. Um, and Paul, you get I think you want to just uh, respond to what I just said. I totally agree, and we did follow up um, on yes. Monday. Fantastic. Okay, I think then then now I will pass it to Erica to discuss. Trust chairman, chairpersonship. Thank you, Carol. Um, so at the last meeting, um, we raised that this is the end of sort of uh, the year, the timeline. Carol and I um, took over uh, for John, who had some pretty huge shoes to fill. Um, it took two of us. Um, and part of it is just to be you know, transparent as well is that both of us felt that it was really important to do co-leadership and co-facilitation. Um, it gives us different perspectives. Carol comes with a her own experience or perspective. I come from my own experience and perspective, and it's a real opportunity for us to check in with each other and, and to really give each other that perspective because sometimes you know you, you have your own blinders and biases. So it's been a, a, a really amazing opportunity to do this, but um, we felt it was really important now to open it up to see if others would like to take on this leadership. Um, and so uh, one, we would just wanna open it up to, uh, if anyone wants to step forward um, to think about becoming uh, the chair or chairs, uh, we wanna absolutely give that opportunity. We can have a conversation uh, in terms of, you know, what it is that we're looking for in chairs. Um, both Karen and I are willing to uh, continue if no one steps forward, but we thought it was really, really important for everybody uh, to think through it. So that's why it was raised at the last meeting. So it's been a month. So hopefully people have thought about it. Um, and so we're just going to open it up to um, whoever would like to step forward or would like to raise uh, any um, feedback about the chair positions or nominate somebody else or whatever you want to do. Hello. Ashley has a hand up. Oh, Erica. sorry. I didn't see that. Yep. Ashley, go ahead. Um, well, I think that it's really important going forward, not just in the chairs, but like in the affordable housing trust that there are more people that have ever lived in affordable housing or have have like actual experience, lived experience with the matter at hand, affordable housing, or, you know, trying to find affordable housing. And so as far as I know, I mean, not everybody maybe wants to talk about their own experience. There's only two of us that 
have really experienced the need for affordable housing. And so just members wise, I think there needs to be more, you know, care for who becomes a member and that those people should have had some kind of experience in needing affordable housing and the system in Amherst that is very difficult to navigate affordable housing wise. And then chairs, if there's two, maybe 50% should have some kind of lived experience with affordable housing or 100%. And so, and that's hard, you know, to find because, you know, maybe there's just not enough people that are even willing to do this stuff, but it, I think it's essential we start thinking like people that have like lived experience are, are, you know, prioritized. That's all. Do we still have do we still have one um, vacant spot? I mean, in terms of just members, we have one vacant spot um, after today. Um, so uh, Sid is uh, ending his term, and um, he is committed to stepping down because he wants others to have an opportunity to step forward. So um, we're we're going to recognize him at the end of the the uh, at the end of the meeting, but um, he has, you know, pretty much said to me um, that, you know, he wants an opportunity for others to step forward. So yes, we will have one position available. And I just wanna recognize Allegra who has her hand up. Um, so I have a few things. First of all, I really do appreciate that Erica and Carol stepped forward when John stepped off the trust last year. I think you guys have done an excellent job and I think you really play to each other's strengths. So if nobody else steps forward, I would be certainly very happy to see you continue on in the role of co-chairs. However, I really do appreciate what Ashley just brought up, and I do think it's really important to center the voices of people with lived expertise in the area. Um, so just thinking about the creation of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee, which is a committee that I co-chair, um, our charge itself actually has um, written into it that five of the seven members have to either be um, BIPOC members of the community or people from other marginalized backgrounds. So I don't know what the process of <laughs> amending a charge would be and if that's something that we'd want to think about, but perhaps that is something that we would consider writing into our Paul, am I making things up? Like, is that something that, like, by by law we can do? <laughs> or, I mean, so I see Paul has his hand up. But before Paul, um, you respond. I just want to clarify, um, Allegra, are you saying for the chairperson, uh, or are you saying for the chairperson and for the members of the trust, I or one or the other? For both. I think, okay. I think the idea of at least having one chairperson with some sort of lived expertise in the area plus additional members um, really does bring to the forefront something that a person who might work in the field of affordable housing might see but not fully understand firsthand. So, okay. All right. Paul is next in terms yeah, of. So, the, so the, um, I think the trust doesn't have a charge it actually comes from the bylaw the by there's this town bylaw that creates the trust and that's where the membership so you'd have to actually change the law to, to if you want to in, in, um, put that into the charge per se we're always looking you know if there are folks with lived experience who are applying you know we you know we need people and are welcoming any folks who put their names forward to do that and um, you know, our CPOs are out there recruiting, but uh, the best recruiters are the people on the screen, right? You know, you, you know, folks, and if you can get people to put in their names, that would be awesome. Um, you know, in terms of the co-chairs, I think it's often, um, I mean, I, we can say that that's a, it's a requirement, but I think that, you know, that puts a, an undue burden on folks who might not be able to take on that that additional responsibility. And so it might be something that the trust as a body might want to keep its flexibility, but that's, I'm open to whatever, you know, you know, I'm going to take a backseat on all these things on what, what the, what the committee wants to do. Thank you, Paul. Um, Ashley and then Risha. Well, so 
I guess one thing is if do you have to commit to being the chair or co-chair for the whole term or could you be I mean I would like to volunteer because but I don't necessarily want to volunteer for two years I'm just wondering if for one thing I think it's really important that at least one chair has lived experience and so that I'm certainly willing to co-chair but also um, I would be willing to do it in an interim kind of way until we had for, for one thing, there's going to be a new member that Sid isn't and someone hopefully who will have lived experience because that's more or less the most important thing to get from a new member. And then maybe we could have different another, um, you know, vote a few months down the road. Does it have to be like a year or two or like three? Could it be much shorter? Well, it's something the group's going to have. It's something the group's going to have to make a decision on. Um, but let me have. First of all, I just want to say I think we need to be clear about what we mean by lived experience. Uh, do you mean current lived experience? Do you mean life experience? Um, because I think there are assumptions made about who has it and who doesn't. Um, so I think we should also define what we mean by lived experience. Um, so it's just something to. To think about, but I'm I'm gonna go ahead and recognize Risha and then Nate. Um, I am commenting on a slight, a related but um, slightly different topic, um, and that is just that I would not. I appreciate uh, both the jobs that you both have done, as well as the reason you wanted to co-chair. Um, with the open meeting laws, I've found having co-chairs to be complicated. Um, because as you write to one person, you've, it's already three people, um, and that starts to become difficult to have conversations and not knowing, I don't want to just pick one of you. Um, and, and so I, I wouldn't necessarily try to set ourselves up for forever co-chairs. Um, and, and a 50% is where I, I start getting worried that we've locked ourselves into co-chairs with open meeting laws. I think that might get complicated. Um, so that's my only thought. Nate? Yeah, I was going to say that typically, you know, boards and committees will elect chairs and officers once a year. They can reaffirm who's already in that position or they can nominate and vote on new ones. And so it's not the term of the, of the person, right? It's not a two-year term necessarily, but it's really an annual um, discussion and vote. And so, uh, you know, the bylaw does also say that, you know, the trust is composed of members that have personal or professional experience in a number of things. You know, at one point, I think the Housing and Sheltering Committee, or maybe the first version of the trust bylaw, we actually did require a member to have, say, some experience with whether it's like being housing insecure or something. But I think that becomes really inflexible because if no one volunteers, then you have a vacancy. And so I think, you know, we have a, you know, a citizen activity forum. We have a process where we review, you know, people who are interested in volunteering. And I think that's something that, you know, if the trust knows they would like that, it's, you know, conveyed through through staff and then as part of the process when we're selecting new members. I think writing something like that into a bylaw is very specific and rigid and it's more difficult than you think maybe to actually implement it. Same with co-chairs. I actually, I actually think that a, having a co-chair who does or doesn't have certain experiences may not make them a good co-chair. I think you know, a chair is someone who can actually manage um, a meeting, you know, do a lot of homework outside the meeting and do things. And sometimes it's really about you might have a good mindset for that kind of organizational strategy. It doesn't matter necessarily what your experience may be with housing or other things, right? So sometimes the good chair of the historical commission may not be someone who has a, any, um, you know, a PhD in preservation or anything, but they are very logical and they can manage a meeting and they can put an agenda together and they can do homework. And so I wouldn't want to limit um, a description of who could be chair or co-chair to something that, you know, again, the person may not want to volunteer for that role. And so, um, you know, I think that, it's really an individual's, um, you know, being a chair does take a lot of extra work. And so it's really, you know, John put in a tremendous amount of time, Carol and Erica have as well. And so, you know, if the trust were to get rolling and all of a sudden, you know, a chair might be putting in 20 hours a month, 30 hours a month, if they're taking on a lot of initiatives and organizing things. And so, you know, I don't want to scare anyone, but, you know, you can make it as big as you want it to be. And so I think, but I do think it's really important. Um, to have that flexibility to let who wants to be chair be chair because it is, 
you know, it's something that they'd want. I want someone to want to do it, right? Not just think that they have to do it. Um, so what I've heard, oh, Carol, sorry. Um, this is a very interesting conversation, but I, I'm, I'm feeling like, uh, I, I trust the trust to be able to say yay or nay to people who step forward and think that they want to be a chair, knowing some enough about each other. I don't, I would rather trust us than trust a rule that we made up. And especially I would not like to see it be that we have, that we have to have some elaborate way to figure out what lived experience counts and what doesn't in order to see if someone is eligible to be a trust chair that just seems kind of actually icky and horrible to me um so that's all oh and the only other thing is i would like to find some way to there are interesting things here to think about but to also be able to move forward with tonight Risha. You know, following uh, Carol's de desire to move forward and then sidetracking us is for a great role. But um, I feel like several times, uh, so Ashley and I joined at the same time. Grover has joined since. We have all joined in a time that we've never, I have never met this group in person um, because I was not able to make some of the in person and I won't be able to make the next ones. Um, I you mentioned that we all know each other well enough. Uh, I'm not sure we do. And I really, really would like to have the strategy meeting as soon as possible, um, uh, ideally in person, at least part of it, um, to really feel like we're working sort of more seamlessly and um, and with a shared vision of what we're headed towards. So off topic, apologies. Thank you, Prisha. Uh Ashley? Um, I think, well, Allegra maybe can speak to this a lot more because, you know, she's the chair of the um, her own committee. But the reason you have people with lived experience is because they know the impact of the decisions we're making. And so if you have people that, and most of the people here have not been impacted by affordable housing personally, potentially, or, or maybe was, you know, 30 or 40 years ago, that, that that's not terribly relevant to right now. And so things have changed. And then having, you know, room for voices, you know, that are different and maybe underheard. Younger people, I mean, people under 40, people under 30, people that are, you know, people of color, Etc. Like that's really useful, and so I think lived experiences can be pretty wide. But some kind of necessity of finding affordable housing is a lived experience that I think is very valuable for for any you know committee like civil rights and you know different committees. But this is one where some people are very you know acutely impacted, and some people probably never were. And that's important. Actually, I, I want to recognize the fact that um, you do prioritize individual with lived experience, and I do as well. But I, I, I really want to caution making assumptions about anyone else. I think what Risha said before, which is we don't know each other very well. Um, but I do agree with you that we want as many people with lived experiences as possible, and we want diversity in terms of whatever diversity um, you know that that we can get uh, that includes age diversity. But I just really want to caution about assumptions. Um, I think you know the decisions that I hear right now is a decision about coaches versus chair. Um, it sounds like they people are interested in having a vote to have one chair versus uh, two chairs. And I think there's also a decision to be made around the length of the term. Um, I would recommend the length of the term be one year because I think it's just too much, um, well, 
that's my recommendation. It's not my decision, the decisions in terms of this group. Um, but I think those are the two major decisions uh, that I've heard uh, people raise. Uh, so I think, uh, Risha, you just had your hand up and then Grover. So I'm gonna recognize Risha and then Grover. Yeah, I, because I'm the person who brought up the co-chairs, I wasn't suggesting we take a vote this round. I was just suggesting that we don't put something in writing long-term that forces us to always have co-chairs. So. Thank you, Risha, for the clarification. And I think, you know, if if Carol or I had made the decision about being the chair, there wouldn't have been co-chairs. Um, I do believe in collective leadership. So for me, it was very important. And I also believe that um, I had limitations in, term of my, in terms of my time. Um, I think, you know, Ashley, you've raised that, you know, there are high expectations of how much we can turn around and how much we can do. And so um, being chair, you really feel the need to be available and to, you know, to, to do a lot of work in between meetings, not just a, um, the agenda for the meetings, but really to connect with people and to follow up. And so um, I think whoever wants to step forward and being chair, you have to you have to make a commitment around time. Um, and so I knew that I was limited with regards to my time and I couldn't, um, you know, fully commit to it. So being a co-chair was a way to, you know, to address that. So anyone who wants to step forward, think about time because it is really important. Um, Allegra and then Grover. Grover was first. Sorry, Grover, Grover, and then Allegra. Thank you, Allegra. Okay. Well, I just want to say, I think this is an interesting discussion for us to be having. And I also am resonating with, like, we don't know each other very well. Um, and I just want to appreciate that, uh, like, Carol and Erica's leadership and the amount of time it takes and also just note like um you know these are unpaid volunteer positions and so it's part of the reason that it's difficult for people who have lived in poverty recently or currently um to join right and so I, i'm just saying that and that i um i'm actually I agree with the one year term and I am excited to talk about the legislative priorities. So um, I, I would move for us to make motion soon um, on either on voting for who the chairs would be. I feel agnostic on the co-chair um, versus single chair for this formation like this next year, I, I agree that I would not like to write it into policy one way or the other, because I could imagine, I could imagine myself feeling quite burdened by co-chairing with some people and strengthened by co-chairing with others. And, you know, it all just depends on people's personalities and capacities. So I wouldn't want to write a strict one way or the other. Thank you, Grover. Allegra? Can I just clarify whether anybody else has actually put their name in that for for sharing? Because if if we're if nobody else is, and then it seems like the decision would be easy. But if somebody else is, then that would be good to know. Ashley, can we? Do we have to vote? this time could we think about it and then vote next time like why does it have to be right now you it you'll doesn't. still be chairs next time probably <laughs> yeah it, it doesn't um it, it's just something that you know we thought was important to raise just in terms of a democratic process um both carol and i have been doing this for a year and we just wanted to make sure that other people who wanted to do this had an opportunity to step forward um and i think this conversation was really really important we may not know each other a lot but i agree with carol i really trust you um all of you as my colleagues here on the trust um to have the best intent in mind uh, in terms of the best way we can work together to increase affordable housing. So this conversation has been really, really, I think, important for us to have. Um, so I wanna, first of all, thank you. And, and I know Nate has his hand up. So I'm gonna recognize Nate next and it sound, and then I think what 
well, let me let recognize Nate next, and then I will recommend what we do next. You know, sure. I was going to say that if if the co-chair model isn't followed um, in the future, typically we'd have a chair then vice chair, so that in the absence of a chair, we have someone else who can run the meeting, and you know, staff can also contact. So just to you know, I just want to put that out there as you know, if you're thinking about nominating someone or yourself, or you know, if you're talking to you know, if you're figuring out what to do. You know, it's either, I mean, I like the co-chair model or the chair vice chair model because we really, you know, I think that we do need to have a vice chair if we have a chair just so we can make sure everything can operate. Thank you, Nate. I would like to, if I can, make a motion that we um, take another month. Um, I actually feel that, you know, with, with Sid moving on and us having a new member, that it might be an opportunity to bring the mem new member on board and but it's up to the group um, to table this conversation right now for today um, but to have a converse uh, have a vote on do we want to cheer or co-chair and that might be dependent on if somebody is interested in stepping forward and if they want to step forward with someone else um, but i think you know we can i would like to make a motion to table this conversation so we can think more deeply about it and then also um I would like to recommend that whoever does step forward, think about it as a year commitment, um, just because I think it's it's um, I think it's a little difficult to do it just for a little while um, and then to coordinate that. Um, so I, I would just like to recommend that we move forward um, and table this conversation. That's totally fine. I just was also like wanting to second Risha's that a lot of us have never met in person and that when we perhaps meet in person to do our strategic for the next term that might be the like a good time to vote on this like when we actually meet each other um because i i don't think that sense of trust i mean i just don't i don't trust necessarily that the priorities well particularly of the town is creating thousands of affordable units for workers and low income people, because I haven't seen it yet. So I just don't think we need to trust much. We need to see results. And I guess that's that's all I'm wanting. So we haven't even met. So why would we have all this trust in each other? You know? We'll plan on having meetings uh, in person. Um, so I think I'm going to not seeing any other hands up move to the next item, just because I want to make sure that we can get to John around the legislative proposals. But I again want to thank everyone um, regarding this conversation I think was so important to have. So the next thing on our agenda is some town updates. And in spite of that, I'm going to suggest, given what time it is, that we move straight into John and do that first. And if we don't do all of the town updates, we will do them next time. And we will do whatever other updates we have to do next time. But the thing that we have that is actually something that we need to do something about, presumably, is the legislative stuff. And so my suggestion is, Erica, I'm going to give it back to you who is going to give it to John. Uh, our, unless you object, Erica, we get to do this because we're the co-chair. So I'd like to rearrange things and have John next. Yes, um, I'm going to make him a panelist. Yes, yeah, sometimes it works and sometimes it does. Oh, here he comes. Yeah. John, you have the floor. Okay, I think I'm here. Uh, thank you. You are, thank you. <laughs> um, I sent out a note, well actually, uh, Carol and Erica sent out a note that I had drafted. Um, there's been some discussion about town policy. Um, town policy is obviously important, um, but we also don't wanna neglect the opportunity to weigh in on state policy to a significant extent. What we're able to do as a town is dependent upon things that the legislature and the governor decide. So trying to keep track of those things is not necessarily easy, um, but it's something that I volunteered to try to help to do. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few things immediately that I know on the, are on the legislative agenda that I thought are important, although there are other things that I think are important that I'm not gonna get to. I'll briefly just mention those. Um, basically, the process should be this. 
I will suggest something and other people can suggest things too. And the goal is to decide whether or not to send a note at a minimum to our state representative, Mindy Dom, and our state senator, Joanne Comerford, advocating for certain pieces of legislation or certain uh, pieces of the budget. Typically, those letters also go to the chairs or the uh, Senate president and the Speaker of the House, and also the chairs of relevant committees. For example, we talked about having James Arcero here, who is chair of the Joint Legislative Committee on Housing. I can't remember who the he's who his co-chair is, who's the senator. But then there are also other committees that do get involved in legislation related to housing, which I will touch on as we go forward. So ideally, if you all want to do this, what it means is you agree to take a position on a piece of legislation, and then Carol and or Erica uh, will would write a letter to the appropriate people, as I outlined, um, telling them that the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust has taken a position in support of this legislation. So this can be a part of your meetings for the next few months. Um, since the legislature currently is focused on budget, but it will also be focused on other policy issues, uh, probably at least through September, if not October. So I guess I'm assuming everybody wants to do this, but if not, you should be letting the chairs know that you don't want to tackle this. Okay, well, then I'll go forward hearing nobody making any objections with the first thing that I had. And again, this is something that I sent to you all or that Erica and Carol sent you all. Um, Senate 869, an act to reduce the financial barriers to renting homes. One of the things that happens when people wanna rent a house or an apartment in Amherst or elsewhere is that the landlord or the agent for the landlord will impose a variety of different kinds of charges. Some of them are pretty straightforward, like first month's rent, uh, last month's rent, a security deposit, but then there can be other kinds of charges as well. For example, a charge for an application or a charge for a key, or uh, honestly, I don't know what else people face because Ashley, I'm sorry to say that I haven't faced having to rent a place in a long time. Um, nonetheless, I know this is a problem. Uh, I talked to uh, people at Craig's Doors, people at uh, Amherst Family Outreach, and I know this is something that their clients face when they try to rent in Amherst as well as elsewhere. So the purpose of this bill is essentially to say there are limitations on what a landlord or landlord's agent can charge for. And if you like that as an idea, then that's something that we should support. So maybe maybe we have to have an actual um, like I move that we write a letter in support of the of the thing John just talked about Senate whatever it is eight sixty nine eight sixty nine thank you so I, I seconded oops sorry <laughs> who, who seconded I seconded okay so. Um, Rob. Um, does it, does this? Oops, Ashley no. was first, I guess. That's, oh, that's okay, Rob. Rob, go. Go ahead, Rob. Does the bill um, propose specific limitations or, or is it just general limitations to be decided? There's specific limitations. In, in essence, it says you can charge for this. 
And that, and this third thing, but you can't charge for anything else. I believe that's the way the bill is framed. Um, that's my understanding of it. Um, I I didn't quote or, or bring with me the specific le language in the legislation, Rob. Can I just follow up quickly? It, um, so it, it limits certain certain charges, but does it limit um, the amounts of, of, you know, you can't charge more than X for security deposit, you can't charge more than X for whatever. Or does it say you can't charge a, a key fee, you can't charge? No, it a, doesn't place a limitation on the amount. I okay. think there actually is legislation before the, uh, uh, that's been proposed that would uh, um, create rent control constraints or at least allow local communities to do rent control which would have the kind of effect that you're talking about but that is not part of this legislation but if it does say first month last month and security there's a there's an amount to built into those right at least based on the rent you can't charge a security deposit of three million dollars i mean it's connected to what the rent is right i believe that would be the case carol Ashley, yeah, I, I'm I'm totally in favor of this. I I hope that we could also talk about not just a state law, but that if we could internally sometime vote on this, could be part of our permitting process that we could because this is prob you know the state law might happen in one or two three years. Who knows? We could even put in our permitting process that there is a a limit on fees. There's a limit on security deposits, you know, et cetera. Maybe we could think about that in a much more local sense, as well as writing this letter that, in, you know, supports it on a state level that might happen in many months from now. There will be permitting of new apartment complexes, even affordable housing ones, at some point, probably even quicker that we could act locally. Ashley, I, I don't know if the town would have the authority to do that. There are certain kinds of things that the legislature or the governor keep for themselves. And if the town wants to do something that is not otherwise allowed by state law, they have to ask for permission to do that. Allegra? Um. So I might be wrong, but I thought that they already did away with finder's fees. So basically, when you rent an apartment, they can charge first, last security, which are all equal to a month's rent, and then a finder's fee, which basically goes to the real estate agent, which can equal up to an additional month's rent. So you could be looking at paying four months up front which is a lot of money. Um, but I thought that, and then maybe it was just in like Northampton that this happened, but I'm looking at Mass Legal Help, which is one of the organizations that does a lot of like tenants' rights stuff. And they have it listed that there's, they can only charge you when moving in a security deposit first, last, and the cost of a new lock and key. So I'm, I'm getting a sense of deja vu. And obviously, if there's legislation pending, like there, I must be incorrect. But I'm just a little confused because I thought this already happened. Well, again, I had conversations with both. Uh, Fran Rodriguez of Amherst Family Outreach, and I think it's Sam Schilke of uh, uh, Craig's Doors, and my impression is that these practices continue. Now, I didn't raise the specific question that you just did, but again, the understanding that I had from them is that there are landlords or real estate practices that represent landlords that do ask for something above first, last, and security. And that's not only in Amherst, but obviously it's elsewhere in the state, which is the reason this law is proposed. 
the distinction and I would be in support of signing this just fyi <laughs> Sorry, the distinction is landlords cannot charge a finder's fee. A rental agent can charge a finder's fee only if she, he, they is a licensed real estate broker. So it still can happen. So I think this would get rid of that. So um, yes, uh, Nate. No, I was just going to clarify, Erica, what you just said in that also, you know, they charge, you know, processing fees, application fees. I mean, so, you know, we'll see application fees, you know, in hundreds of dollars. So, you know, to process, you know, there might be a processing fee of $350 in addition to the finder's fee and everything else. So, you know, the, I mean, you know, I, I, I was looking at the, the bill now, the specifics, there, there is some language, but I think it's, it's a step in the right direction. And I think that, you know, it's something that, may need to be amended and then changed over time, right? It's hard to capture all of these things, right? So the bill says, uh, um, broadly speaking, you know, a lessor, it doesn't say, if it, is it the owner or the agent or the, or whatever. And so then it becomes the, you know, there's probably gonna be some interpretation there that it's anyone working for the owner, whether it's the agent or something. And so it's really trying to limit all these fees that then other different parties can charge, right? And so, um, the legislation is, is somewhat broad, I think, to capture all that. And then it limits it to first, last or security, and then a key. So really there's only three fees that can be charged, not first, last and security, and then blah, 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 you know, like whatever else they start in, inventing. So, um, I mean, no, I mean, that's what I see. I mean, I, I mean, a pro I mean, processing fees, it's really like, you never think like, oh, I'm going to charge a $400 processing fee, but all of a sudden we, I'm seeing processing fees. Like, what is that? Um, anyway, so I, I yeah, I, I think that, I think it seems pretty straightforward. I don't, I think it's a, a really great idea. So we're hearing a lot of support for this. Do we need to take a vote? Yes, you need to take a vote. Oh, thank you. Uh, right. Erica, sorry. Thank you, sure. Um, Erica says yes. Uh, Carol? Yes. Uh, Allegra? I uh, couldn't hear it. Yes. Oh, thank you. Ashley? Yes. Rob? Yes. Paul? Yes. Sid? Yes. Risha? Yes. Grover? Yes. Thank you. Hopefully I didn't miss anybody. So, oh, Grover, you have your hand up. Well, I was going to make a request of the chairs regarding agenda. Go ahead. Was, so, I liked, I liked it. I supported everything on John that John submitted on the list, and also there was some other bills um, that uh, were in the link that was also shared that I thought was worth lending support to or sending a letter to, or at least having the conversation. And also I know we're nearing the end of time. So I'm wondering if someone could clarify for me the time window that we have on these. Do, do we have another month? Like if in a month we, we decided to support other bills, would that be effective or is it too late in the session to have impact? Good question. John, can you answer that? I believe it varies with the type of bill. Um, for example, anything having to do with the budget needs to be acted on now, I believe. Anything that is a non-budget bill could be uh, could wait a month or two. But in general, the sooner the better because the legislative process moves on. And if you miss the window when they're holding hearings or gathering information, um, it is what it is. Risha? Sorry, I'm just acknowledging that I have a hard stop and I'm going to have to step off. Um, if it's possible to for me to vote uh, through, via email, I'd be happy to do that. If not, uh, you have a quorum. So. 
So uh, we just voted on the first one, um, saying that uh, you vote that Carol and I uh, write a letter to Representative Dom and uh, Senator Comerford to support that particular bill. Um, I think you have so many more, um, John. I think what might be helpful is to figure out which ones we need to act on quickly and which ones can wait, and then we can bring it to the next meeting. Well, um, the next two items are, I believe, budget related. Uh, the next two have to do with transfer fees, which is something you've already had extensive discussion of. Essentially, there are two transfer fee proposals for you to consider, um, and they're not mutually exclusive. It's important to point out. The first one is one that has been proposed by the town Amherst, and specifically the legislation has been sponsored by Senator Comerford, uh, and that's the uh, Amherst specific transfer fee in which there are provisions in that one that are not in the general transfer fee legislation that's been proposed by a statewide group. There are a number of towns that have proposed specific legislation in which they're asking for the state legislature to give permission for them to proceed to do a special transfer fee. And that includes Amherst. And you've heard from uh, Mandy Jo and Anna about that. Um, and my recommendation would be that you uh, tell Senator Comerford and Representative Dom to support it. They already are supporting it, but it wouldn't hurt to repeat the fact that you are supporting it. The general transfer legislation, I would also recommend you support. Um, that's one that really just has to do with providing towns the flexibility to create a transfer fee within certain parameters. It's up to the individual town to, survive, to, to, to determine all the money in that case goes, excuse me, into supported housing. Um, that would benefit many communities in the Commonwealth. Um, I personally think that it's worth supporting both uh, transfer fees because honestly, we don't know what the legislature is going to do. And I'd be happy with either or both being supported. So I'll make a motion that um, that the co-chairs be given the uh, approval to write a letter to support both. Second. Thank you, Allegra. Any questions, concerns, comments? Uh, oh, Ashley. Just that the next meeting, hopefully um, on the agenda is the things we want to talk to the CRC about that are, um, you know, let's say bigger than the affordable, the things we can't do on our own. Like there's probably quite a, a bit of a list going on. Thank you, Ashley. And, and just to clarify, are you talking about the legislative items that John has brought forth? No, I mean, not just that one. I mean, if, if we need the CRC for the, those things, that's fine, but I'm saying like, all the things we talked about that like we probably need town council members to like ultimately vote on so like that can we change not our charter but like the bylaws that kind of help guidelines that help our board have more um people that are impacted by affordable housing recently the kind of thing that i think we talked about several things that were crc like things that they need to input on because it's eventually going to get to the town council. And it's so it's kind of like things we need town council to eventually vote on. We need to talk to the CRC about. Let's make a list of that. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ashley. That was proposed prior. So, yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. um, okay, yeah. So it's 9 03, and I just want to pay attention to time. Um, John, I think you said these were the two that were budget related. Are there any others that are budget related? Well, there's at least one other that was in my uh, memo, and that has to do with the full funding of Community Preservation Act. Um, don't worry, 
Don't we have to finish voting on the thing we were trying to oh, vote on? We have a motion yeah. that was made and seconded, and then we got off track. And I think we should finish voting on the thing we're voting on. Thank you, Carol. I vote yes. Okay. And thank I vote you. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Allegra. Yes. Rob. Yes. Paul. Yes. Grover. Yes. Sid. Yes. Ashley. Yes. Erica. Yes. Okay, um, so the last item has to do with the match for Community Preservation Act. Um, the state has typically, well, has not in the last several years appropriated enough money to be able to what uh, to what towns appropriate at a local level for Community Preservation Act. Um, so uh, I believe. Uh, I think Erica, you got this estimate from Sean Mangano. Yeah, about 52% we received versus 100%. So we got 52% from the state. Right. So that's a, uh, about $700,000 that the state could have given the town of Amherst. Um, typically, the CPA funding from the town is about 50% of what's available. So housing does quite well in CPA funds. And if there were more CPA funds, I would hope that the town would do better. Um, so the legislature actually is in a little better position this year than they were certainly two or three years ago. And so if there could be full funding or something closer to full funding of Community Preservation Act, that would definitely benefit the town and probably benefit the affordable housing program. So again, I'm, I moved that we support uh, that the two co-chairs write a letter in support of full funding of the CPA. Anyone would like to second? Sure. Ashley, go ahead. Yeah, I second it. I second it. Any conversation, concerns, questions? Okay, we're gonna vote then. Uh, Grover? Yes. Sid? Yes. Paul? Yes. Rob? Yes. Ashley? Yes. Allegra? Yes. Carol? Yes. And Erica, yes. Okay, all voting yes. Um, and I also recommend that we put um, legislative proposals a little higher on the agenda um, since they seem to be really important and will impact um, the trust's resources and, and opportunities to increase affordable housing. Yeah, um, Grover reported, uh, sorry, uh, referenced the CHAP of priority, for priority list, which does have a number of important things that we would like, I think we should look at um, the biggest in terms of budget would be a housing bond bill, which the governor, governor has yet to propose. There was a housing bond bill a couple of years ago under the previous administration, and we were supposed to get some money out of it, but we, I don't believe we did. Uh, I checked with Mindy recently on it, and she didn't think there was anything that was sprung by the governor related to that. Um, so uh many of these really are social justice issues although i there may be some that have budget implications there probably are that i'm skipping over uh but uh unless you want to spend some time as a group looking more closely at these tonight um then i think uh it'll be time to move on yeah, I think it be, since it's already 9.07 and, and I'm not going to assume that other people don't have some things that they need to do, um, I think we're, we're going to move on. Okay, I thank you for your attention and I'll try to be a little more succinct and be prepared to come on a little earlier next thank month. Thank you, John. Thanks. Thank you so much because this is so important. Um, so absolutely. Uh, Nate? Yeah, I was going to say that on the CHAPA website, you know, the link that John sent, I think there's like about 14, um, you know, bills and other things. And I think there's other. So 
I agree that um, having this earlier on the agenda and then, you know, if John wants to come back, I, you know, there's a number of ones to discuss. And so, um, yeah, I, I did, that's all I want to say for, for trust members that we can send that out again. I think I sent it again today, but that document had the link. And then if you go to it, you can go to Chapa's website and they have a nice summary of each of them and then a link to actual text, but it, it will take a bit to read through and digest it all. And, and I did provide you with a link to um, all of the bills that are before the joint housing committee, um, but there are well over a hundred bills. So that's really getting into the weeds. The other thing I wanted to point out though, is that the transfer fee legislation is not before the joint housing committee. That's before the revenue committee. Hmm. So you have to be somewhat cautious in trying to be sure that you cover what's important because it all doesn't necessarily come out under the housing rubric. Thank you. Jimmy. Okay. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up since it's nine Oh nine and uh, Carol is that, are there any announcements? Um, I know we're supposed to also ask for public comment um, before we adjourn, but I feel like we have run out of time and I don't see any hands up. Um, I do want to just uh, appreciate the fact that Maura Keen, Jennifer um, from the CRC and town council and Sam attended throughout the whole meeting and are still there. Um, so not seeing any hands up, I think we should, if there are any other announcements before we end, I just have one more last thing. So Carol, I don't know if you have anything. Um, I don't think there are any announcements that you haven't already seen in something that someone sent out. And most of them are about things that you could do um, so you've seen all of the things that I would have announced. So I'm going to assume that if you wanted to do any of them, you've already figured that out and are doing it or not. So no, there aren't announcements. Thank you. Um, Nate, could you put up the last item? Yeah, can you enable share screening, um, screen sharing, sorry, as the host? Okay, let's see. Where do I do that? Sometimes it's easiest just to make him co-host. Yes, make him a co-host. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's right. I have to just go to your name. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I knew it was somewhere around here. Thank you. Great. Your co-host. All right. All right. Well, it's my pleasure. Also, it's with a heavy heart um, that uh, Carol and I, and hopefully all of you will join me in thanking Sid for his extensive commitment, his extensive work um, in terms of increasing affordable housing here in Amherst. Um, I think Sid, you said you've been on the trust for maybe eight, 10 years? Eight, eight years, I think. Eight years. Um, I, I did look and I think it was 2017 that you were at mm -hmm. least on the website. Um, yeah. And so the, you, the service that you've provided, the input that you've provided, the perspective that you've given us, um, it's just really invaluable. So um, we just want to appreciate you and appreciate your commitment and appreciate work and appreciate the connections that you have in the community, both at UMass, uh, and you know, we know that you could never speak for UMass, but to give us some insights, not to speak for them, but to give us some insights to help us think about how to create the bridge in, in a relationship um, that's meaningful and that can get us moving forward, as well as with all the community members that you are very well connected to. So we just wanted to thank you. We want to recognize you for your commitment. And I also want to also underscore one last thing, which is that what you said to me today is that you know, you would be willing to continue to serve, but you really believe that there's there. It, we need to have opportunities for others to step forward, and so you're making a space for that. So I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, appreciate if this is important work. It's uh, you know save lives here by doing this type of work. So thank you, everyone. It's been it's been an honor to serve in here um, in this group, and uh, best of luck. You know, I'm always at your disposal if you ever need me, ever need any connections with anything. And um, best of luck to all of you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sid. Thanks. 
Okay, with that, we are going to close the meeting. We have a lot uh, to discuss at our next meeting. Um, and I just want to wish everybody a good evening. And I want to thank everybody for all of your um, what you've shared, um, your commitment to making sure that we do the best work and that we never forget um, for those people who are struggling um, to get housing, uh, to be housed, and to not be housing burdened in terms of either rent or mortgages. So thank you so very much, and we'll see you next month. And please come to the June 20th listening session. Thanks. Thanks, Sid. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sid. Thanks, John. Still in the meeting?